God, we glorify and worship your name, O oh Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the blood of the Lamb. We glorify you, Father. We thank you. Amen. Good to be in the house of God tonight. We're going to continue to clap our hands. Let's sing unto God in an attitude of worship. Lift them up as we sing out this next song. Your love, O Lord. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice. God, we glorify you. We thank you, Jesus. Your name is holy, Lord. Amen. Let's slow things down in this place tonight. Let's open up our hearts to God. Let's continue to praise his name. Sing out to him with all of our hearts. Let's close our eyes, raise our hands as we sing up this next song. Well, before I spoke to Spoke a word and you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so good. God. 
salvation oh god we thank you for your presence tonight god you are holy we love you god we honor you tonight praise god good to be in church amen uh, good to be in the presence of god always uh, uh, love coming into the house of god amen with an attitude of praise amen that's a right perspective to come to church amen we've come tonight uh, to bring glory unto God, and amen, really does uh, feel good in God's presence tonight. We want to go before God uh, this evening to have a number of prayer requests that we want to uh, remember to pray for, amen, many uh, sick in body. We want to believe God for them tonight, and maybe uh, even tonight you're in pain or you're sick in your body, amen. We want to believe God uh, for a miracle uh, in your body, amen, asking God to uh, touch you this evening. We want to uh, remember to pray if course for our baby churches, uh, our grandbaby churches want to uplift them before God tonight. Uh, their services, I always uh, think in the back of my mind, uh, our churches on the East Coast are already completed with their services, but uh, we do want to remember to pray for them, asking God's hand, God's favor uh, over them. We want to pray tonight for our uh, missionaries, Pastor Fernando, his wife, Socorro, amen. We also want to pray for the apostles and the Avayes, amen, want to uh, just uplift them, amen, praying for the nation of Chile, amen, that God would help us uh, in uh, Chile, amen, that God would give us breakthrough in that nation. We also uh, are continuing to pray, amen, for uh, uh, our pastor who's with us, amen. This week's been wonderful uh, just uh, hearing from God, uh, but want to pray uh, for the service back in Bullhead tonight, amen, God's grace upon them, uh, the Bullhead saints are faithful, uh, doing the will of God. We want to uh, remember to pray for them also 
praying for the Prescott Church, for Pastor Greg Mitchell and his wife Lisa, uh, our leadership. Amen. Just want to pray uh, that God would help us in these last days, that God would give us uh, understanding, discernment, as we've heard this week, to uh, uh, navigate our way through this time and this hour. Amen. That God would uh, help us. And most importantly, amen, a daily prayer of mine is God, pour out your spirit. God, we need you to move. We need God's favor. We need revival. Amen. God, is the God of the impossible. He's the God of miracles. Amen. The God of signs and wonders. Uh, amen. We believe that tonight. Amen. And we are here tonight to call out to God, to ask God to move. We want to remember our nation, our president, our leaders, our military, our first responders, just so much uh, that we uh, have responsibility to pray for. So we do want to remember all of these needs. Amen. How many of you tonight, you have a need in your life that you want to bring before God? So I want to ask you, uh, to join with me tonight in prayer. Let's vocalize these prayers before heaven's throne. We're going to pray asking God's hand upon this service and Lance will come and open us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you tonight. God, we're asking you. God, to move in your power. God, we're asking you, God, for your hand upon this service. God, I pray, God, that you would touch our sister Sandra. God, bring healing into her body. God, I pray, God, miracle power. God, touch your body. God, bring in you now. God, ask for you. God, we come before you in this place with an attitude of worship. God, we're asking that you would touch this service. God, that you would bring, God, a spirit of... God, conviction, God, that you bring a spirit of deliverance and salvation. I'm asking, God, that you would touch this service. You would open our hearts. You would anoint this message, God. We're asking that you'd give us wisdom, God, and clarity, God, that you would bring a spirit of dominion and authority in this place tonight, God. We cast out every attack from the devil, God, that you would touch our needs, God, that you would touch the sick and the unsaved, God. We're asking that you would touch this city, God, that you would just bless this nation god that you would continue to use us in your kingdom god that you would continue to bring opportunity to preach your word god we're so grateful for everything you're doing in our lives and what you're going to do we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name i pray amen man praise god you could be seated we want to welcome uh, everyone out uh, to our wednesday night service amen good to be in the house of god uh, in worship, in prayer, amen, contending what a, a great week of revival uh, we've had, amen, just refreshed through uh, the preaching, people getting saved, um, and my uh, daughter said on the way to church tonight, she says, man, this revival is going by fast, uh, but usually they do, amen, especially when God's moving, we do uh, have one night of revival uh, remaining, amen, so just want to uh, encourage you, amen, to uh, be praying, amen, and uh, working with people as uh, you're at school, work, uh, wherever you go, invite folks out, and we'll believe God for uh, great things uh, uh, tomorrow night. I do want to just give a couple of announcements real quick uh, uh, for uh, your attention. Uh, this coming uh, Saturday, uh, there is uh, uh, going to be a, a youth uh, uh, event in uh, uh in Prescott, and so a number of the youth were coming to me and saying, Pastor, we want to go to this, and so uh, if you want to go, amen, I'm going to uh, release you to go to that. They're going to have a, a, a great uh, concert, or excuse me, a play, I believe, uh, on Saturday, and so uh, there will be no concert here in Yucca Valley, so do uh, be uh, aware of that. Uh, we do have uh, sign-up sheets for uh, the out-of-town outreaches, would really I uh, love to help at Palm Desert. Amen. Help us in this. Uh, uh, this is a critical time. You've heard me preach it. You hear me in the prayer request. Uh, we need to support our baby, our grandbaby churches that they really desperately uh, need help outreaching. So we're going to be sending an impact team uh, into Palm Desert. There's a sign-up sheet for that. Uh, so please uh, sign up your name. So also uh, for the uh, Corpus Christi uh, uh, so being said that possibly some people would rather fly than drive and so I'm willing to do whatever we can to get people there so if that's uh, the case so just let me know we need to uh, begin to plan that I know it's still a few months down the road but um, always good to uh, be ahead uh, on that and so uh, again if that's something uh, that you uh, would want to do if you would please uh, get that to me uh, and uh, we'll uh, begin to uh, plan 
uh, for that. Uh, then, uh, as uh, uh, Halloween is coming upon us, we're going to actually do uh, a trunk or treat here in our church parking lot uh, s a Sunday evening uh, of uh, 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 for the Halloween. And so we're going to do this as an outreach. Uh, so we're going to be setting up a number of booths, uh, and we're going to set up, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Going to bring in hay, jumping castle, uh, different activities. Uh, we're going to have some uh, uh, booths set up for games, uh, but we're going to try to uh, bring and draw people in uh, and as they're here we'll have music playing but most importantly we're going to be witnessing and so uh, just uh, we did this last year at our 180 and uh, we gave out a thousand pounds of candy uh, but we want to do a little more than give out candy uh, by all means bring their thousand pounds if you want uh, of candy no kids complain about that but we really uh, want to get people onto our property uh, just thinking with our parking lot and uh, just uh, kind of giving our church some expression uh, to our community, letting people know we're a church, uh, letting people know that we care, amen, and uh, really contending that some folks will get saved. And so if you want to be a part of that, we'll this coming Sunday, not tonight, but after revival, on Sunday after service, we'll have a meeting uh, so we can start delegating uh, uh, help for that. Uh, but just kind of get that uh, working in your mind um, as uh, uh, that will be upon us sooner than later. Praise God. That's the announcements tonight. If our uh, ushers uh, will come, uh, want to uh, receive uh, the offering. Uh, my brother uh, sent me uh, an article uh, this afternoon, and uh, the title of the article says, For uh, $84,000, an artist returned two blank canvases titled, Take the Money and Run. <laughs> so uh, if you're Catching on to that, uh, they were paid, uh, they paid an artist to uh, paint these paintings and they returned them back blank. Uh, you know, people are calling art, you know, art has a, 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 you know, I've seen what some people call art and I'm like, man, that's art, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, can you imagine uh, getting returned a blank, uh, uh, you know, canvases, uh, something that you've invested in something uh, that you expected for some kind of uh, return. You know, uh, I've uh, come to a conclusion. I uh, do not just give to get. Amen. I, uh, you know, uh, yes, we know that's true. The Bible says that God gives a test and see that I will not give, press down, shake, and running over. We know that concept to be true. And obviously there are times where we give as a sacrifice and we're in need of something. We need God to move for us. And there uh, is a, a that uh, a need but you know uh, we're in a lot of church services we come to church a lot revivals we're coming a lot uh, not every offering is a sacrificial offering not every offering are you going to come and give the sacrificial but you know uh, i've been of a firm belief that you should give in every offering amen you know, I know with uh, now with uh, our giving online, uh, we uh, give online. And so I have seen, you know, uh, that uh, we are faithful to tithe. We're faithful to give. But I challenge you to your offerings tonight. You should give in every offering. I believe that is something that uh, holds value. That's something that we're coming tonight, amen, to hear from God. And uh, every offering is an opportunity to give, whether you're giving online or uh, you're giving into the offering tonight. I want to encourage you don't don't give don't give a blank amen don't uh, say well it's just a, a blank uh, this is no this is a time to give amen and i uh, i have uh, prayed about this and i've uh, thought about this a lot because i know many people with the online giving we're giving one sum we're giving our tithe but uh, uh, oftentimes with online we're no longer giving in every offering so i just want to encourage you to do that uh, let uh, that to minister to your heart if it uh, uh, would sink in amen if it would find place um, i believe uh, that will really uh, uh, continue to be a blessing in your life. Our heads are bowed. Our brother Angel Abar, if you would, ask God's blessing on this offering. Amen. God bless you as you give. Can you believe what the Lord has done? Can you believe what the Lord has
We've heard some powerful preaching this week, amen, just uh, uh, been a refreshing week for me, amen, I want to encourage you tonight, uh, open your hearts, uh, amen, let's uh, welcome our pastor tonight as he comes. Thank you, son, thank you. Praise God, amen, so good to be here tonight, amen, I really do uh, count it an honor and a great blessing, amen, to uh, be able to preach, and not only that, but to be here in uh, Yucca Valley, a church that we uh, have such uh, wonderful ties and wonderful relationship with. I was uh, uh, talking, Brother Anthony was telling me a story that I was really interested in before church. He uh, recently got hired and he's working down in Palm Springs and a, uh, a rabbi asked him to put in these special bathtubs in his house and uh, that they were very, very unusual bathtubs. How many have a bathtub in your house? Amen. Uh, bachelors, I suggest if you want to get married, a bathtub is a good idea. Amen. And, and, uh, but these bathtubs were very, very unusual because they were, they were very, very deep, uh, 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 high-profile bathtubs. And, and uh, Anthony, he gave me the technical... Uh, 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 you know, the, the law, the Jewish law name for these bathtubs, but uh, I don't know what that, what that is, but the purpose of that is for cleansing, amen, and uh, uh, that's what these rabbis do. Uh, obviously, they believe in the Old Testament. They do not believe in Jesus, amen, and it just made me so appreciate, amen, the the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ, amen. And I got saved in 1977, and God made cleansing a real, uh, real revelation to me, the desperate the need that I had for cleansing. And, and uh, thank God, amen, tonight, that as we sit in here, one thing I love to say, uh, you know, we're not a perfect people, amen, but we are a cleanse people we're made clean by the blood of jesus and i'm i'm grateful for that tonight i trust you've been blessed amen i have uh, all this week i've been blessed i felt god's presence i i have felt god's ministering power i have no intention of retiring People are coming to me because of my very extremely youthful looks, and they're asking me, are you retired? And I just smile. I just, I don't go into full detail. You know, I said, no, I'm, I'm not retired. And you're not retired? I said, yeah, I, I have no intentions of of ever retiring and be, because I love doing this. Amen. I, I love being here. You know, I... I love looking at the results of what our fellowship, I mean, look at Daisy, man. That's awesome. That is awesome. Amen. The people in this church, it's, it's amazing. I get to come here and eat menudo. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, First John, if you have your Bibles this evening. Most of you, you're aware now with uh, the uh, DNA testing that is so available today that that a lot of men, and it's very a very sad story, a lot of men sitting on death row have been freed because they've been able to find some uh, lack of DNA material as a result. Uh, many men, literally, and it's frightening, they've been freed from death row. In the United States, as of September 2011, 273 people, including 17 inmates on death row, have been exonerated. They, on death row, can you imagine? Go home now. Go home now. You have been, you have been mistakenly charged. You, you didn't commit the crime. 
His name is Gary Lamar James. He was exonerated. DNA testing exonerated him after spending 26 years in a penitentiary for a crime. Can you imagine spending in prison 26 years for a crime you did not commit? His name is Henry McCollum. He spent 30 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Eddie Lee Howard was exonerated after sitting in death row for 30 years. Paul Browning was freed after 33 years. And my point is, is you're not going to spend 33 years in a United States penitentiary and come out normal. You're not going to spend all those years in the pen and come out as you went in. That time that you have spent in prison is going to change you forever. It is going to have powerful impact on every area of their lives. And I can honestly tell you, unless God touches these men, unless God helps these men, they will never, yes, they are free, Yes, they're free. Yes, they're exonerated, but they will never be normal again. They'll never shake off the effects of being wrongly accused. Can you imagine being wrongly accused? Can you imagine being unjustly accused? I don't know if you've ever been, you know, I don't want to ask you if you've ever been in, in court, had to face a jail judge before. I don't want to ask you, you know, for a show of hands. I don't want you to scare off the visitors tonight. But can you imagine, you know, you're sitting, in, you're facing a jury. Your future is in their hands. There's a prosecuting attorney. He wants your head on a plate. The judge, he's going to decide the outcome of your case. And can you imagine standing up, the verdict is read, and they said, we, he's guilty. And you're innocent. You're innocent. You did not commit the crime. I mean, to call that your worst nightmare would be a compliment. I mean, can you imagine to hear this court finds you guilty, and you're not and then they take you to prison. And then you go through the gates. And then you go into your cell. And you hear that cell door slam behind you. And every morning for years, you wake up. You're in prison. You tell everybody that you, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And they tell you, so are we. <laughs> how many in the church are just like this? How many in the kingdom of God? How many believers, precious, precious believers, precious saints, veterans of God are just like that? And what I mean by that is that you spend much of your life incarcerated, you spend much of your life in bondage to that ugly, horrible, despicable spirit of condemnation. Many believers, many good saints in the church, the devil holds you in bondage. You've done things in your past as we all have done. Past failures, horrible mistakes, I've done things in my past grateful to God you'll never know of. We've all done this. And so many times as we try to step out from the shadow of our past, so many times the devil comes along, you know, and uses your past against you. The devil tells you you'll never get free. You'll always be this way. And as a result, he cripples you. You're, you're unable to walk in victory, power, and dominion. And mark it down, condemnation always chains you to a past failure. It always chains you to a past mistake. And the curse of condemnation 
is that you feel that you can never get free. I want to talk to you tonight about the cloud of condemnation. I'll, I want to talk to you about coming out from the cloud of condemnation. And we're going to read tonight some of the greatest scriptures in the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1. And we want to read verses 1 through 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and which our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which, which, was, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and this very famous phrase, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. First of all, tonight, I want to talk to you about speaking of sin. Speaking of sin. I'd like to tell you tonight at the onset of this message tonight what God's desire is for every believer concerning sin. Starting from me, doesn't matter how old, doesn't matter how young, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved or how short you've been saved, this is God's desire for every believing Christian. Uh, he wants you to get the victory over sin. And what God wants you to do is God wants you to, his plan for you is to give you deliverance over sin and the, and the consequences, the effects of sin. And so this is God's plan for your life concerning sin. I want you to hear this scripture. This is what God wants you to hear concerning sin. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. This is God's plan for every believer in this building tonight. As believers, sin is no longer to control your life. Now, to help us understand that verse... I always like to read different translations that give us better clarity. One translation says, sin shall not have the mastery over you. Another one said, sin must no longer control you. Another one says, sin shall not be Lord over you. And then the final translation, sin shall no longer be your master. And so when it comes down to the subject of sin, and sin is, is a very important issue because you have to deal with that to make heaven your home. How I many you want to make heaven your home? Then you have to be aware. You have to deal with this issue of sin. And God's desire for every believer is this, is that sin does not have dominion over you. I am not saying that we are to live perfect lives, that we are to live flawless lives, that we are to never, never sin again or make a mistake. I want to tell you, I promise you, you will sin. Nod your head at me. You will sin. You will fall. You will make mistakes. But what the Bible is clearly saying is sin is no longer to control you. Hello, operator. Sin is no longer to be your master. Sin is no longer to have the ruling, dominating, 
the upper hand in your life. And I want to tell you, if you're here tonight and you name the name of Jesus, and if sin is still your Lord, and if sin is still your master, if you're still helpless in control of sin, you are in trouble. You are bound for hell. You are bound for hell. And so scripture is teaching us we can have dominion. That it doesn't have to rule in your life. Over and over, <coughs> there's a term that the Bible uses. Another term you ought to pay attention to. It's mentioned 26 times alone in the New Testament. It's the term eternal life. How many of you are interested in eternal life? Now, this doesn't mean just significantly, you know, just, just a period of time or a length of time. When the Bible mentions, when it speaks about eternal life, obviously it's talking about, you know, a, a length of time, but also involved in eternal life is a quality of life. That's what you're going to have in eternity. That's what you're going to have in eternal life. You're going to have a quality of life. And so one of the blessings and one of the benefits of eternal life, which starts now, now that you're saved, now that you're right with God, one of the blessings, one of the qualities of life that God wants you to have is that you no longer live in bondage to past sin. In other words, that you no longer live in, in condemnation and, and fear of things, of you, to, mistakes that you made in your past. Every one of us, as I've said before, we have all done things that we are ashamed of. We have all done things that pastor doesn't know about, your, your spouse doesn't know about. But I want to tell you tonight, as we stand here, normal, common, everyday, believers in Christ, all those things that we've done are in the past. All those things that you have done, you read it in your Bible tonight, are under the blood of Jesus. And so in eternal life, it's not just a length of time, but it is quality life. And a part of the quality life that God wants you to have here and now is to be free from the guilt of sin. To be free from the guilt of the past, the, the shame and the humiliation that everything that condemnation brings into our life. Now, as I mentioned early, earlier, two of the most powerful verses about sin in all the Bible are in our scriptures tonight. Verse number seven, you ought to underline, and verse number nine you ought to underline. First is verse number seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I'm telling you tonight, you know, because I don't know you. I do know my church in Bullhead City. I know the quality men and women of God that, that struggle under the cloud of condemnation. And I want to tell you, if you want to be free from condemnation, you need to know what that word cleanses means. What cleanses? How many of you know the, the good feeling that comes from a nice hot shower? A nice hot, you know, trip to the bathtub, bathtub a, a cleansing. And so to give you an insight about this word cleansing, the Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And, and that word is not talking about a one-time cleansing. In other words, what it means is when you get saved and when you begin to live your life for Jesus Christ, when you begin to, as the Bible says, walk in the light, there's an ongoing cleansing in your life. And what that means, how many know what that means? You don't have to get saved every day. There's an ongoing cleansing. You don't have to get saved once a day. Every day, 
all the days of your life. How many of you have seen new converts that, that uh, uh, for the first year, every time there's an altar call, they raise their hand every time. They've been saved 365 times in the first year. You don't have to do that because of this ongoing cleansing. If your heart is right with God, if you're really trying to honor him and serve him and walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ offers us an ongoing cleansing. In other words, there's no need to repent every single day. Are you with me tonight? The second verse about sin is in verse number nine. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And there's that word again, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, what God has done is he's made provision for your humanity. He's made provision for your fallen flesh. He's made provision for your, our, our, our failures. If, if you are faithful, if you, if you sin and if you repent, this is God's word for you. I will forgive you of your unrighteousness. That's as simple. That, how many understand how clear that is? In other words, regardless what you've done, if you will genuinely repent before God, God says, I forgive you. I remove the stigma of your sin. I remove the shame of your sin. I remove the condemnation. I remove all the past blasts from your sin. And listen, uh, what can you say? If God has forgiven you, you're clean. If God has forgiven you, that's all that matters. Remember, in salvation, God offers us an ongoing cleansing, an ongoing forgiveness, an ongoing healing, ongoing wholeness and deliverance. And I want to read it again. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, this is not saying you have to be perfect. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Are you with me tonight? Now, I see some of you are so excited about that, you're standing up and break dancing. That's powerful. That's the foundation of all the New Testament. You're forgiven. You're clean. There's nothing else to add. There's nothing else to say. But here's the problem. Is that we struggle sometimes with believing that. I want you to notice the other scriptures that are couched around these two powerful cleansing scriptures. These two powerful forgiveness scriptures. Look at verse 6 and verse 8 and verse 10. All of those verses begin with, if we say. If we say. Let me read verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Listen again, God has no problem forgiving you. No problem forgiving you. There is no problem in cleansing, clean, right with God. It doesn't matter what you've done. Hopefully we've already established that. Forgiven. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, not perfect, you fall, you make a mistake, you get up, you keep going, you repent of your sin, he cleanses you from all sin. But see, the problem, the problem lies with us, with what we say. 
with what we say. We struggle believing that we are forgiven. Forgiveness, it's easy with God. And sometimes it's not so easy for us. And the deal is here tonight, look at me please. What do you say about your sin? What do you say about your sin? What do you say when God convicts you of your sin? What do you say when God shines the light in your heart? What do you say when God exposes darkness? Do you say sin, sin? I don't see any sin. What do you say? God convicts you of sin. Do you say, you know, I'm not as bad as brother so-and-so. I'm not as bad as sister so-and-so. One of the most important questions that you will ever hear in all your Christianity is what do you say when God reveals your sin, when God exposes your sin, when God shines his light on your sin? If you have an open heart, if you have an honest heart, you say, God, have mercy on me. You say, God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. You are right. I am a sinner. And listen, God can work with that. God can, God can help that. God can bring deliverance to that attitude. And I want to tell you tonight, you know, because there's a, there's a couple of new believers in this church tonight, and you're a brand new Christian, this is why it's so important that you come to every church service. This is important that you learn to be faithful to the house of God because it's in the house of God, God reveals you. It's in the house of God. God shines the light on you. Never run from the light of God. It's in the house of God. doesn't convict you in Walmart. He doesn't convict you, you know, at whatever. Church is the place where God purges, where he cleanses. Church is the place where, where God speaks and confronts you. This is the body shop. And you come in here, and this is the body shop where God makes you whole again. And I want to tell you, saints, because this is an older church. If you could go to church here for a long period of time, and God doesn't convict you, God doesn't ding you, God doesn't flick you, God doesn't pop or confront you, either you're dead or the preacher's dead. Because the church is to be a meeting place with God when you've sinned. People love churches where they never preach on sin. People flood churches where I can feel comfortable. You know, one of the things, and I, you know, you got to learn how to take your compliments as a preacher. Is I have people, I haven't seen you in church in a long time, you know, and you know, I, I don't feel comfortable there. Do you understand? Sinners shouldn't be feel comfortable in church. They should feel conviction. Today's churches, you know, they preach happiness. They preach self-affirmation. They preach entertaining programs. Churches today, they don't want to preach on sin. They don't want to preach on commitment, loyalty, and faithfulness, and and don't preach on anything that might make me feel uncomfortable. Don't preach on don't preach on money because you know that really really upsets me. But I'm telling you that's the mark of a New Testament church. Is that when you're not right, you should feel uncomfortable in church. Listen carefully. It's a wicked wicked church that makes you feel right when you're not right. The declared word of God should bring conviction of your sin. When you sin and you come into God's house, you should feel conviction. 
C.S. Lewis said, if you're looking for comfort, I wouldn't recommend Christianity. And I want to tell you, God loves his church in Yucca Valley. Your pastor loves his church. I love this church. You are the saints of God in Yucca Valley, California. But I also know that the saints of God from time to time, every once in a while, you have a desperate need to be confronted with your sin. From time to time, you need to be deemed about you. And, and when your pastor preaches on sin, when the preacher preaches on sin, understand it's not because he's hard. It's not because he's mean. It's not because he doesn't love you. He preaches on sin because he does love you. Do you understand that tonight? Galatians 4.16, I've always loved that statement. Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Thank God for all. I love the Yucca Valley Church. I, I Thank God for all that you enjoy here in a church service. You know, your song service is awesome. Your praise, your worship is awesome. You have friends. You have, you have glorious fellowship. All the encouragement you get week after week and month after month. But the true mark of a New Testament church is conviction of sin. And I pray to God that you never get comfortable in this church. You come to the place where you're no longer convicted of your sin. God's house, God's word should bring conviction, a confrontation between a holy God and sin. And the critical factor is what do you say when God confronts you about, when God jerks your covers off? Will you repent? Will you confess your sin? Will you say, God, I agree? You are absolutely right. And forgiveness and cleansing comes when you say the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin. Now let's talk about, the. now that we've got the bad news out of the way, let's talk about the crippling effects of condemnation. I've learned as, a, as an older pastor this is a subject that has to be dealt with again and again because God's people are damaged by the past. They're damaged by things they've done that they shouldn't have done. They carry the guilt of it. They carry the, the shame, the humiliation of it. And so get the picture. In this place are people who really love God. They really, really love God. They want to serve him. They want to do right. They want to be right. Yet day after day, they live under this cloud of condemnation. And what condemnation is, as I've already explained, it's going to prison for something you've already been pardoned for. It's going to prison for something you, you've already been clean, cleansed, cleared. You've already been freed. Condemnation is when you're unjustly accused and you're sent to prison all the while you're totally innocent. Are you with me tonight? Listen, when you confess and repent, I, I know it's simple, I know it's basic, but we struggle here. When you confess and repent, it's a done deal. It's over. It's over with God. Psalms 103 verse 10. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgression from us. You know, we love to tell sinners that. We love to tell them, he separated your sins as far as the east is from the west. In other words, these never, never meet. And this is the truth. But you need to be reminded, this is how far God has removed your sin. 
Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. You want to write that down on the cover of your Bible. Don't just write down the, the scripture, Isaiah 43, 25. You want to write that whole scripture on the front page of your Bible. God says, for my sake, I blot out your sins. You ever had a blot on your shirt? God says, this is what I do. I, I blot them out. Other translations literally means, because I'm a good God, I blot out your sins. Other translations, by virtue of my goodness, I blot out your sins. My nature is to blot out your sins. And that's what God does for us who are unworthy, who are totally undeserving. The New Living Translation says, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my sake and I will never think of them again. That's deliverance from condemnation. If you confess, we're all human vessels. We're all flawed, weak human vessels. But if you will confess and if you repent, it's a done deal with God, but not with the devil. Come on, folks, don't shout me down because I'm preaching good tonight. You're forgiven, you're clean. It's over with God, but not with God. The devil. The devil wants to rub your face in your sin. The devil, what he wants to do, he wants to get maximum mileage out of your failure, out of your mistakes. When you sin, the devil will not let you go that easily. When you want cleansing, when you want forgiveness, he pulls out the past. He pulls out the ugly things that you've done. Get the picture. God says, free, done, over. I don't even remember it. That's what God says. And that's all that matters. But the problem with condemnation is the devil wants to send you back to prison for something that you have been clear from you've been pardoned from and there's I don't know how many how about you tonight is there anybody in here you walk under this cloud of condemnation it's an assault from hell you're cleansed you're forgiven but but you say you struggle you don't feel cleansed and forgiven I want to examine a couple of fruits of condemnation tonight. Number one, walking under the cloud of condemnation will shake your relationship with God. If you're saved, you know the devil hates you, wants to destroy you. But if you feel on top of that because of condemnation, the devil hates you, the devil wants to destroy you. But if you feel on top of that that God's mad at you, and God doesn't like you, how many of you know you're in trouble? And what the devil wants to do, he wants to shake your confidence in God. Listen to me tonight and, and maybe write it down. God will not abuse you. He will not abuse you. Yes, he will discipline. Yes, he will chastise. Loving correction. That's that word, chastise. Loving correction. Yes, God will correct you. But when it's done, it's done. You know, I don't know if you've been abused by your parents, you know, and, and your mom or your dad, they corrected you. And then for days later, they're still mad at you. They're, they're still angry with you. Listen, God is not that way. God disciplines, God corrects. And when it's done, I, I read it 20 times. He remembers it no more. Amen. Bible, Bible, God won't abuse you. The second thing that condemnation does 
is it makes you feel like you can't live for God. It makes you feel like you don't measure up. You know, when God's people, when you fall to the same issue again and again, you begin to feel like, I can't live for God. I've failed in this area so many times. I've fallen here so many times. I've even been afraid to ask God to forgive me again. I'm afraid to ask God to restore me again. And then they start thinking, why bother coming to church? Why bother praying? Why bother doing anything? And the devil wants you to believe that you can't live for God. I want to tell you something about living for God. It's not hard to live for God. It's impossible to live for God. On your own strength, on your own power, on your own ability, you cannot live for God. Hebrews 11, without faith, is it impossible to please him? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The blood of Jesus Christ that makes you free. If you will confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. You believe that by faith. Those that come to God must come to him and believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. The blood of Jesus sets me free. You receive that by faith. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. You accept that by faith. And I don't care what you've done. If the blood of Jesus makes you free, you're free. But you have to exercise faith to believe that. I can't do that for you. Brother, you're free. You're cleansed. You've got to believe that by faith. And the fruit of that, the fruit of that is the removal of condemnation. The third thing that condemnation robs you of, it robs you of your heart for ministry. I want to tell you how valuable are the people in this church that are working and laboring in ministry. Have you ever heard this voice before? How can I tell anybody about Jesus when I'm barely making it by myself? How can I witness? How can I have effective ministry when I myself are barely hanging on? How about this one? I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I better pull out of ministry. How can I be involved in ministry with all my problems? You do understand that people in ministry have problems, don't you? You do understand that, right? Condemnation strikes at your ability to minister for God. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you if, you, if you have problems in your life, and let's say you're in a band, you had a problem, let's say you sinned on, on Friday and Saturday night when you grab the microphone to minister, you're, the devil is going to condemn you. Look what you did the other day. Are you with me? You ever, you ever get in a big fight with your wife and then you have to preach at the 180, you know, the next night? Well, you probably can't because most of you are not even married yet. <laughs> uh, how about this one? You ever had a fight with your wife and the very next service, Sunday morning, pastor preaches on loving your wife and then the devil comes to you and reminds you, what did you do Friday night, big boy? Can I tell you, those of you in ministry, those of you in ministry, if failure disqualifies you from ministry, no one, no one, no one would be able to minister. If you have to be perfect to be in ministry, this would be an empty pulpit tonight. This would be the loneliest place on the planet. And maybe you're here and you have a heart for God. But because of condemnation, the devil always bringing up your past. Maybe you've withdrawn from ministry. Maybe you've pulled out of ministry. That's what condemnation does, is it blinds you of the love of God. It blinds you of mercy, grace, forgiveness, healing. And if you pulled out of ministry tonight, listen, 
there's hope for you. Don't give up because you made a mistake. You're a human being. I want to close. Let's talk about clearing the air. One of the most powerful tools for condemnation is called the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Because the book, the Bible will tell you the truth. Regardless how you feel, regardless con condemned, feeling condemned, feeling guilty, feeling ashamed, the Bible tells us the truth. And if you want to be free from condemnation, please read your Bible daily. Read your Bible. Condemnation is a wicked, wicked whirlpool. There's an article about two men in Phoenix, and uh, they were out in, uh, what is it, the town lake, I think is what it's called, and they were out canoeing. Both of these men were expert outs outdoorsmen. Both of them were athletic, physically fit, top shape. They loved to hike. But what they did is in their canoeing, they came upon a, a, uh, a, hyd a hydraulic pump uh, there in that in that little uh, that little lake, uh, and they hit this hydraulic pump. This pump just creates these powerful swirling currents, and as physically fit as they were, they could not they couldn't keep from being pulled under. And the reason that I told you that is lots of God's people. You know, spiritually you're strong, you're healthy, you're sound. But once that wicked tentacle of condemnation attaches you, attaches to you, if you don't know your Bible, you're going under. What I'm trying to tell you is that the answer for condemnation is Scripture. The answer for condemnation is not how you feel, because you feel, already feel guilty. You feel God's mad at you. You feel like God doesn't like you. No, no, no. You don't get your cues there. You get your cues from the Word of God. There's only one thing that will keep you from going down, from going under, and that's the Word from this, from the words of your Bible. Have you ever seen an accident, car accident? They can't get the victim out of the door. What do they get out? You ever seen those jaws of life? You ever seen them? They get those jaws of life, and it don't matter. It's like scissors to a piece of paper. Just, boom, and they're out. God's given us some. God's given us some, some scriptures that I don't care how you feel, how ashamed, how humiliated, how condemned. If you will, if you will write these scriptures down on the inside cover of your Bible, write them down. I want to give you four or five, and then we're going to pray. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You fall. You get up. God, I want to walk in your Spirit. I want to live for God. There is there now, therefore, no condemnation. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Clean, restored, forgiven, no strings attached. It's called unconditional love. He just loves us. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and he will cast all their sins into the depths of the seas. 
Let's bow our heads. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I told your pastor the, t this afternoon, I told him I was kind of struggling on what to preach tonight. I mean, specifically, I knew every service this week what I wanted to preach. And, and as I began to sit down and just try to get the mind of God, there it was. There it was. Cloud of condemnation. My concern is for the health and the strength, the blessing and the well-being of God's people. My concern is there's a devil that, that beats on God's people, torments. He, 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 one of his master weapons is this, this ugly weapon of condemnation. And when you stop and think about it, you're freed, you're cleansed, you're washed. And yet you feel guilty of the things that God has totally cleansed you from. It is good to say that I am clean in the eyes of God. It is good to say if you're 15 years old that I am washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. What that means is you are, you're clean. As if you never sinned. God says, I don't remember them. If you repent, walk in the light. I will remember your sins no more. Blot them out. That's God's answer for condemnation. Is there anyone here tonight, you're not born again, you're not right with God, you've never been forgiven of your sin, you've never experienced cleansing from the Lord Jesus Christ. We'd love to pray with you. God is in this place tonight, and he's waiting for an honest response from you. God, have mercy on me. I repent. I turn from my sin. God, will you cleanse me? Will you forgive me? And the good news, he's waiting for you. Open arms, he's waiting for you. Anyone here, you want to get your heart right with God, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Please, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hold it up. Wherever you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Hold it up. Hold it up. Pastor, I'm not right with God. I preach good news tonight, forgiven, clean. I preach the bad news first. You've got to be honest about your sin. God bless you. Thank you for your hand. Will you come to grips with your sin tonight? My final call. You're not right. You're backslidden in your heart. You want to get your heart right with God. Join these honest hearts. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, those of you that raise your hand, sis, would you stand up, sweetheart? Brother, brother, stand up. Come and stand up. God bless you. Come and pray. Come and pray. I need a sister. Thank you. Thank you. Just come, sweetheart. Kneel down. Let's stand to our feet. You're cleansed. You're free. You're right with God. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, that's what I want to do. God has made room for our provision for our humanity. When you, as a believer in ministry, when you fall, it's going to happen. You will sin. And the devil wants to give maximum mileage. I promise you, he's going to come. God forgives you when you repent, but it's not that easy with the devil. He's going to rub your face in it. He's going to tell you, look at you. You consider yourself a Christian. You call yourself a man of God. You call yourself a woman of God. And this is why you can't go by your feelings and emotions. This is why the only answer that you have to have is you have to have the Bible. If we will confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. And that needs to be your bedrock foundation that sets you free from the spirit of condemnation. Let's pray. Let's sing this chorus as these would pray and lay a hold of God tonight. Red. 
presence for me everywhere that I go Lord let your presence flow rain on me of divine joy unspeakable overflowing in my soul this heart I Amen. Let's worship God. Let's give God praise tonight. I want you to lift your hands. Begin to thank God. Thank God that you're clean. Thank God that you're forgiven. Thank God that you're pure, that you're right in the eyes of God. To say that I am right with God. The blood of Jesus sets me free. Begin to worship God. Thank God for that tonight. Amen. I want to I want to say a, a mass prayer tonight and and I've just really I've just tried to spell it out as as simply as the Bible as the word of God brings it to us tonight. Is the devil, he's a master at what he does. And what you have to have is you have to have an absolute confidence. Your heart's right with God. You want to serve God. You wanna, you're going to walk in the light. Your, your, your heart is to do the will of God. And God tells you tonight, you are clean. But oh, how the devil loves to bring up the past. And so tonight I've given you a number of scriptures. Two others, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely of heart. And you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And then Hebrews 10, 17. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And their sins and iniquities. Listen, that will heal you. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Brother, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. Never use God's grace as an occasion to sin. But the fact of the matter is, you will fall short of the glory of God. And when you will repent, God is faithful and just, not only to cleanse you, but to remember your sin no more. There's a story of a man that fell into sin. Sin sin overtook him. He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. He's repenting. He said, God, it's, it's me again. He's trying to make his way back to God. He's trying to repent of his sin. And the story says that the man says, it's me, Lord. I've, I've sinned again. And God told him, you did what again? In other words, God had forgiven him, and he remembered it no more. It's me, Lord, and I've sinned again. And you're genuine, and you're honest in your sin. God says, I forgive, and I don't quite remember what you have done. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, God, I so thank you tonight for your word, your truth, the light on my feet, the light to my path. And God, I trust you. I know what you said about my sin. And God, tonight I repent. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I desire to serve you 
and follow you all the days of my life. And right now I turn my attention to the devil. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You liar. You usurper. You tormentor. I bind your influence against my mind. Every spirit of condemnation from past mistakes, past sins, devil, it's under the blood of Jesus. And I plead the blood of Jesus on you. You're a defeated foe. And I have victory and forgiveness because the blood of Jesus sets me free. Let's worship God as pastor comes tonight. Praise God. We're going to be dismissed tonight. I love one another as you go tomorrow night, uh, final night revival. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Carlos, if you would, ask God's grace as we leave tonight.